Hello there guys, RMP792 here. Um, once again, just doing a uh, little vlog on something that interests me at the moment. And this week I want to talk about Netflix's Voltron show. Uh, at time of recording, season 3 is out and has been out for... Three days? It's Monday now, it came out on Friday basically. Um, but I appreciate that a lot of people might not have had time to watch season 3 yet. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I will start with general completely spoiler-free impressions, uh, then I'll talk season 1 and 2 spoilers, and then I'll talk season 3 spoilers. So if you've only seen as far as the end of season 1 and 2, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about it up to there and then you can stop the video, or if you haven't seen it at all and you're trying to figure out if it's the kind of thing you'd be interested in, um, I'll, I'll talk about you know, general spoiler-free stuff at the start. Fair enough. Uh, as far as comment etiquette goes, I have no problem at all with anybody discussing anything in any of the three seasons. Uh, but if you can just you know, stick a little spoiler warning at the top of your comment, just in case people haven't seen you know, season three yet or anything like that, I think that's just good etiquette. Uh, but that's just me. Uh, if you think my hair looks weird at the moment, that's just because I've just got out of the shower. So, yeah. <laughs> so... I really like Netflix's Voltron show. Um, I should preface this by saying I have seen none of the original Voltron show that it's based on, uh, whether the original anime or the uh, American dub version. So I'm approaching this purely as its own completely separate thing, and I'm not going to be doing any compare and contrast. It's purely a case of you know what I think of this show as a show on its own. Okay, but yeah. I really quite like this show. It helps that I have what could best be described as a giant robot fetish. Uh, it's part of the reason I like Pacific Rim so much. That, yeah, we, we need more things with giant robots, basically. And it helps that the animation for the show is really good. Uh, as far as I'm aware, it's done by the same team that did the animation for um, Avatar Legend of Korra, which means it looks absolutely fabulous. You know, the character designs are solid, the actual, you know, the design of uh, Voltron itself is great. You know, the lions actually really have this sort of sense of scale. And it's it's all, you know, pretty good. If you're not aware of the basic concept, uh, it's fairly simple. There are a group of people on Earth. And Earth is, it has a space program, but it's, it's you know, it's still sublight. It's still poodling around the star system. Um, and there's this mysterious crash on Earth. And they go, and this small group of people basically end up toddling along to find it, and discover that it's a pilot who went missing on a mission towards the edge of the system. And he's ranting about aliens kidnapping him and uh, the wanting to come to Earth to find something called Voltron. And they end up finding this sort of giant blue lion, well, robot blue lion, um, which uh, ends up carrying them off into the far depths of the universe, where they find out that there are four other lions, each one a different colour, which, when combined together, form Voltron, the greatest weapon in the universe. Um, and if that sounds goofy to you, yeah, it's goofy. It's fun, though. Um, <laughs> is, is my honest uh, assessment of that. You know, so each of them ends up being the pilot of one of the different lines, and they're referred to as the Paladins of Voltron. Um, so, Shiro is in command of the Black Line, which basically forms the body, to all intents and purposes, um, and the head, and is effectively the team leader. Uh, Keith is the Red Line, which is Voltron's right arm, um, and is sort of effectively the second in command, insofar as your know, right, right hand... But, you know, right hand of God, whatever. Um, uh, Pidge, the team's techie, nerdy person, is in the green line, which is the left arm, and um, you know that's very much the you know the, the scientisty, nerdy character. You, you've seen this, you've seen these archetypes before. I'm not going to deny that, but the characters themselves are fun enough that I don't mind that they're a little archetypy. Um, then you've got uh, Hunk, i.e. The slightly tubby one who really likes his food, uh, but you know, is, is very loyal and and you know, and uh, very very friendly. Sorry, I've got a bit of a lump in my throat this morning for some reason. <clears> there <throat> we go. 
don't know if that's got rid of it, but we'll see. Um, you know, who is uh, the yellow lion, uh, which is uh, one of the legs. I right leg? Left leg? Can't remember. Um, and then finally you've got Lance, who is the team doofus. Uh, <laughs> Uh, on uh, in the blue lion and the other leg, and it you know I I don't mean to insult Lance. Lance is actually a very good character, um, even if half the jokes revolving around him do amount to yeah he's not as cool as he thinks he is. But this is the kind of show where you do get character development, which is good. Um, in addition to those five, you've also got uh, two people who basically. Well, Allura is, uh, you know, she's referred to pri as Princess Allura, but given that her father is now dead, she probably should be queen. <sighs> That's something that always bugs me. But given that her entire civilization doesn't exist anymore, I can understand her not wanting to take the title. I mean, let's be honest, queen of uh, an exploded ball of you know, rock and ash isn't exactly queen of much. And uh, her, you know, and Karan... Who is the best thing in the goddamn show? Because Karan is amazing. <laughs> uh, you know, Karan is just, uh, Reese Darby, just having a lot and a lot of fun. Um, you know, insofar as he's basically a sort of colossal goof, but, you know, he's very, very clever and, and you know, very, very loyal to Allura. And it's, it's... You know, it's, it's those seven basically against the evil might of Zarkon and uh, the... Why the hell am I blanking on what they're called? I'm blanking on what the hell the evil uh, empire is called. What the hell, brain? <laughs> oh well, it's not really important. You know, there, there's an evil empire uh, which is run by this particular species um, headed by a, you know, apparently immortal uh, dick named Zarkon. Um, and, yeah, it's, it's basically, oh, we've got to free the universe and, and fight the bad guys and, and do all that good stuff. So, one thing I really do quite like, and we're kind of nudging into Season 1 spoilers at this point, so be wary, uh, is that the first episode is actually quite long, insofar as they were clearly contracted to do 13 episodes for the first season, um, and I suspect they came back and said, look, there's no, you know, we've basically done this first three episodes as an arc that ends with them effectively getting Voltron for the first time. But we can't come up with a good place to break it. Do you mind if we basically run the first three episodes into one, do an hour-long pilot, and then do the rest of it as 20-minute episodes, and there's only 11 episodes in that season. And I'm assuming Netflix basically went, yeah, sure. Uh, because that's that's what they did. So most of the episodes are 20 minutes long, but the first one's an hour. And that really works, because rather than trying to cram everything in 20 minutes, which would you might have been able to do it, but it would have been really, really rushed. Um, you know, it gives them enough time to set up everything, get everybody where they need to be for the ongoing story. Um, and as far as the ongoing story goes, yeah, it's got a certain amount of serialization, while also being, uh, you know, self-contained insofar as it's quite often the case of you know, they'll go one place and do one thing and that'll lead to them having to go to another place and do another thing but you can theoretically watch the episodes without having seen them but with that said you know, quite often there'll be cliffhangers I mean, it's very much a show that benefits from the fact it's on Netflix so you get a season at a time to watch through uh, with that said the cliffhanger at the end of season one is really annoying it's fine now that season two is here, but when it first you know, came out, that cliffhanger upset a lot of people because it's it, yeah, it's just kind of what the hell, guys. Because um, of course, at the end of season one, they all get scattered. Um, so I'm assuming if you've watched to this point, you've you've seen at least season one and two. So I figured out in the last episode, or in the last episode, when you start getting all those clues that Zarkon was actually the original Black Paladin, and you just realise, oh, bugger. Um, now, that that was actually a legitimately good sort of thing that I didn't see coming originally, and, you know, it and it works, especially because it gives Zarkon this, this good arc for Season 2, where he's trying desperately to reclaim the Black Lion, 
And in doing so, all he does is drive it further and further away from him. He loses more and more control as he goes on. And, you know, seeing his desperation to get it back is actually really, really good. You know, and of course, then you've got the big blowout fight at the end where... Um, sorry. You know, where they're fighting him in his sort of, you know, super-duper armor. And, and, you know, it's it's pushed to its limits. And then you've got the moment when Shiro effectively managed to reclaim the Black Bayard from him. And, you know, and you finally get the Fire Sword. Which, as I understand it, was kind of Voltron's main weapon in the original version. And they're sort of saving it here for very special occasions. Which I kind of like. That's that's kind of, you know... You know, it's the, okay, we're pulling out all the stops. Set the sword on fire. <laughs> you know, because there is no reason why a giant robot would use a sword as its primary weapon. Other than cool. Um... <laughs> Let's face it, so many fictions that involve giant robots involve them either punching, using swords, or anything like that. You know, um, Starfleet. If you've never seen Starfleet, go look it up. I might talk about it in the future. Um, you know, they have a giant robot that punches. Uh, Warhammer 40,000. You know, Titan melee weapons are a thing. <laughs> Even though Titans are ridiculously large, and, you know, Titan melee weapons are ludicrous, but they're there because they're fun. So, you know, giant robots that fight in melee, it's a thing. Um, and yeah, it's it's pretty cool. Um, I like the fact that they don't overuse the Voltron forming animation too much. Um, you know, because you can tell that kind of comes from anime, because anime has a habit of reusing animation to save money. You know, you, you see it in, in so many different things where it's, you know, Classic example in Pokemon, you know, that, that thing of Ash turning his hat the other way around. Yeah, they, they only did that, like, once per season and then just kept reusing it, you know, because it saved money, which, yeah, fair enough. But, um, you know, it is... They don't overuse it. You know, they, they, they only tend to use the forming animation effectively at a time when it's going to be cool... You know, there's quite a few occasions where they basically need to form Voltron, and rather than just show the animation as usual, they'll just say, right, team, we need to do this. And then it'll cut to something else, and then Voltron will come in and, and smack the bad guy in some way. And they do that quite a lot. I also like the fact that in Season 2 they started adding a lot more complexity to the war, insofar as they brought in the Blade of Marmora, implying that, you know, not all... I still can't believe my brain has completely blanked on the name of the goddamn alien species. Um, no, I got nothing. I'm, I'm going to have to look this up because it's bugging me. But, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm IMGB is your friend. I'm going to, the, the second I see it, I'm just going to be uh, really annoyed that it took me this goddamn long to remember it. Or oh, hell, that I couldn't even remember it. And it doesn't even say in the bloody summary. Bal Galmora. No, uh, no, the Balmora is, is the uh, alien creature thing. Um, uh, Gora. That's the name I was after. Yes, yo, uh, so the Blade of Balmora um, basically being effectively members of the Gora species who are not happy with their leader. Yes, I always like it when they add in this kind of complexity. It's the same way that Avatar uh, Last Airbender Season 3, you know, showing the Fire Nation as, as you know, not just a bunch of bad guys, was a really good thing. So adding more complexity there was good. Uh, the revelation that um, Keith has some Gora DNA somewhere, you know, back in his lineage, was you know, interesting. They haven't really done much with that yet, but I'm assuming they will at some point in the future. Um, and the mystery at the end of Season 2, where, you know, of the where the hell is Shiro gone? Good ending. Insofar as, you know, good cliffhanger that just made us go, wait, what? Okay, where the hell are they going from here? You know, um, along with the, rebel, the uh, revelation that oh, I can't her name now. Um, hang on. Didn't I, ha I didn't have to look that one up. Uh, the revelation that Hagar was actually a um, an Altaian. 
yeah, lots of you know, plot twists added in there, and then of course the uh, mention of Prince Lothar. You know, as this kind of okay, he's obviously going to be a significant player next season. You know, so so season one and two, you know, form a good solid story arc of basically Voltron rising, you know, becoming stronger, facing the villain, and ultimately defeating him. Um, and season one and two feel more like one complete season that got split in half. I think it's the best way to describe them. And that's not a problem now that both season halves are there, but it was quite irritating when we only had the first half. Fair enough. So yeah, overall, I really quite like this show. Now I'm going to talk about season three. So if you haven't seen it yet, go watch it, and I'll see you back when you have. So yeah, final warning, three, two, one. Season three kind of pisses me off. Um... Mostly because I didn't know going in that there was only seven episodes. Yeah. Which means I basically got as far as the end of episode seven, and I shotgunned them in, in one sitting, basically. Um, and thought, okay, we now know some more stuff. Yeah, we've seen the creation of Voltron. We've got the backstory. Yeah, we, we've seen Zarkon's fall from, you know, from Noble Paladin to Galactic Evil Bastard. What, yeah, what's next? What do you mean that's the end of the season? You bastards. It's basically got the same problem as the end of season one. It feels like an incomplete arc. It, you know, it... Yeah, I, I suspect when we get to the end of season four, which we know we're getting in only a few months, um, you know, we'll be able to watch season three and four together and feel like we've got a much more complete mini arc of the show. Um, as it stands, season three is kind of disappointing in that it's entirely set up. You know, so you've got the first episode where we show that you know, that, you know they can fight individually a lot more effectively than they used to be able to. You know, that many Gora fighters used to be a reason to run away, and now you've just got uh, Lance and Hunk just you know fighting them all and and being confident about winning. Then you've got uh, the, the story arc where they basically have to decide who's the new Black Paladin and, and where do they go from there. And Keith taking over as the Black Paladin makes sense. And I actually like the character development they give Lance by making him the new Red. You know, insofar as, you know, they really define that the Red is the right hand of the leader, which is, it's really nice symbolism that. I do quite like that. Um, you know, it also helps... You know, and then Alora ends up as the new blue paladin. Um, it does mean their armor colors are all whacked to hell. Uh, because nobody's bothered changing their armor color, and Alora is going with pink as her, you know, armor color, which. <sighs> yeah, she's the girl, she's pink. Hmm. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just not going there. It's not worth getting riled up about. Um, with that said, I mean, Pidge is a girl and she's in green. You know, admittedly, I s the the whole you know Pidge is you know pretending to be a boy thing kind of pointless in the grand cosmic scheme of things. But I almost kind of like the fact that it's pointless. Insofar as you know you you, you know, when she basically admits to them that uh, she's a boy, you know half of them respond with yeah I already knew that I'm not stupid. You know and Karan's attitude was we were supposed to think you were a boy. <laughs> You know, and uh, Lance is the only one who's actually freaked out by it because, well, it's Lance. What the, f yeah, what the heck were you expecting him to react to that as? But, and you know, and then you've got the whole thing where you know it takes them a while to to bond to this new team arrangement. You know, Keith has to learn how to pilot the black line because it's a you know it's more ponderous than the red. You know, the red is fast and nippy, whereas the black is is slower and more controlled. Is probably the best way to describe it. You know, same way that um, Lance has to figure out how the hell he flies uh, the red line, because it's got a lot more juice than he's used to with the blue. And Allura has to learn to work with her line rather than just trying to come at, rather than just trying to order it around. Um, so that's a pretty good sort of little two three part arc. Also lets them show off uh, you know Prince Lothor as, as really kind of dangerous and twelve. I'll get into Lothor later. Um, but, yeah, so, that's, you know, quite good, um, 
I like the fact that if you pay attention, they are definitely using the correct coloured Bayards, though. You know, so Keith's sword is now black, you know, and uh, Lance's rifle is now red. And they've changed the designs on uh, several of them. Um, and the way I see that is them getting more control over their Bayards. You know, so, for example, there's a bit where Lance has basically added a scope and a longer barrel to his rifle... Uh, so he can use it as a sniper rifle, and then later on, it basically reverts back to the more sort of, you know, assault rifle kind of design, which I like. Because again, that's just a little indication that they're getting a little bit more control, a little bit more command over the technology that they're using. You know, because we know that the Bayards can do all sorts of swanky stuff from when Zarkon was using his. Um, incidentally, is it my imagination, or does the way Allura use hers with that kind of, you know, chainy, whippy, slicey whatever the hell that is, um, remind anybody else of what Zarkon was doing with his at the end of Season 1. Because um, I wasn't sure what they were going to have her do, because we've seen her staff fight before at the end of Season 2, but uh, I wasn't sure how they were going to use you know, use her better. But hey, uh, it looked cool, it works for her. Um, then we've got the episode that basically seems to indicate what happened to Shiro, but... Uh, well, actually, no, no. Before that, we get the episode with the parallel universe. And them finally explaining what makes Voltron so special in that it's basically made of this reality jumping substance from a parallel universe. Okay. Uh, yeah. I I'm willing to go with that. Yeah, we saw that there was a meteor crash. And, you know, me building cool stuff out of crashed meteors is a, is a sci fi and fantasy classic. So I don't have a problem with them doing that. And, you know, it's it's very much, here's what, you know. Part of it does kind of take away from, you know, Voltron's mystique in that here's what makes it so cool. But at the same time, it establishes firm ground rules that they can use later on. You know, and seeing the sort of, you know, you know peace through uh, lobotomy method of uh, doing stuff. Yeah. That... that that actually reminds me a lot of uh, Dalek Empire, uh, which you pr I have no idea if you've heard of Dalek Empire. Short version, it's a series of um, audio dramas from Big Finish Productions that are basically a series of Dalek stories that do not feature the Doctor. So uh, at the end of season of, of the first series, basically, the Daleks contact this parallel universe of Daleks who have conquered the whole galaxy, or the whole universe. Yeah, you know, and they bring them over. And these Daleks are horrified at what our universe of Daleks have done and start trying to exterminate them. And it feels like these are you know, these are good Daleks from a parallel universe. Until you start realizing that, yeah, they're just as bad, just in a different way. You know, yeah, they basically, you know, effectively lobotomize people in order to keep them, you know, to, to suppress their violent urges and all that kind of stuff. You know, they are peacekeepers, and that's peace at the expense of freedom. So, yeah. But either way, that's a pretty good, albeit very, very dark episode. Um, and of course, Lothor nicks off with the second asteroid at the end of it, which basically means that he can build, presumably, evil Voltron. Um, and he's, you know, and then we've got the one with Shiro. And I'm not convinced that's really Shiro. Um, again, this is what I mean about Season 3 feeling like it's all set up and no payoff. Because we clearly hear them talking about some sort of operation, which implies they let him escape. Uh, which implies either it could be a clone, because, you know, they had Shiro's DNA, you know, presumably from the time he was captured. You know, replicating his arm's not difficult, that was Gora Tech to begin with. You know, they could have done something to the arm, they could have implanted something in his brain... Who knows? But either way, I'm there's obviously something going on there that's going to come to a head at some point. So, yeah, as I say, might be Shiro, might not be. I'm leaning towards not really him, but we will see. He definitely believes it's himself. Now, whether that's going to turn out to be you know, brainwashing or, or mental conditioning or whatever, I don't know. But there's definitely something up there. Uh, then we've got the one where we find out that Lothor's already built his evil Voltron, and frankly, it's kind of 
disappointing. Yeah, I, I, especially once we establish that Lothor basically has his own paladins, insofar as he's got four, you know, lackeys, you know, plus himself. They were, you know, that, that's clearly building up to evil Voltron. Though, to be fair, the thing we've seen that has been built could be One Piece. That could be the, you know, the equivalent of one of the lions, which I suspect is probably what they're going to end up going with. Uh, so we'll see where that goes. And then we've got the big final story, which basically is all about um, Zarkon and the backstory, and you know, finding out who Hagar really is. And yeah, it's a good episode. <laughs> you know, I, I always like episodes that delve into lore and backstory, and you know. Showing that King Alfor was, you know, kind of a bit of a reckless hothead when he was uh, young, and and you know, Zarkon, you know, kind of repeatedly saved his ass, and you know, really showing the bond between them. Um, you know, the first time they actually get to use Voltron itself, and they, you know, and you realise that yeah, they don't have a, cl you know, the Voltron wanted to be built, and Alf, the fact that Alfor built it, you know, was was kind of almost incidental, in a weird way. You know, he he. He doesn't really understand what he created any more than the current paladins do, which is kind of cool and kind of creepy and kind of ominous. So we'll see where the hell that goes. But, you know, seeing Zarkon without his kind of you know, croaky evil voice was kind of jarring, but it really kind of worked. Uh, the fact that Hagar has turned out to be his wife and that they've just been so sort of consumed for so long that they've actually forgotten yeah that's kind of dark um, and, and kind of cool which presumably means she's Lothor's mother I would assume um, but then again I don't think he's 10,000 years old so somebody else presumably um, so yeah I, I suspect we'll find out what's going on there later um, so yeah that's kind of what's Gone on in the main plot. Then we've got. Am I saying that right? Is it Lothar or is it. No, Lorgar's Warhammer 40k, Lothar is this. Okay. Um, bloody science fiction. Anyway, um, I like him as the new villain because you know, his initial scene where we, you, know, you see him leading from the front effectively insofar as you know, he's fighting in the Colosseum you know, and he knows that uh, that particular general's going to try and betray him, so he just calls him out in public publicly defeats him, and then publicly forgives him, you know, earning the praise of the people, and then basically sends him off to whatever the he to, you know, the equivalent of Siberia, basically. That's top quality political manipulation, and that shows him as a different kind of villain to Zarkon. Which is good. You don't want your second villain to be, you know, just the first one liked, basically. You need them to be different, otherwise there's no point in replacing the villain at all. And, as I say, I like his little squad of sort of evil paladins. They kind of don't get enough screen time. You know, I couldn't tell you their names, for example. I, I can broadly describe them. You know, you've got a uh, weird ponytail girl. Um, aggressive, punchy girl. Uh, creepy, blind, but with the kind of adorable pet cat one. Um, and... Oh, and that one's also a psyker. Um, and... What the hell is the fourth one? Oh yeah, and the, uh, the fourth one's the one who they encountered in the Bulmera. I like that they actually explained who that was. You know, that was a good kind of callback to a sort of minor plot point that I'd forgotten about, but that you know, really, you know, you know, the moment when you were like, oh, oh, uh, you know, because at that point you're wondering what the hell they need the skull trite for, and and. You know, what the hell... We have no idea what the hell they were doing on that base, so... No. I like him as a villain. You know, um, him kind of showing off with his sort of swanky fighter. You know, shows that he is dangerous. You know, but also very, very arrogant. You know, what he should have done was bring everything to bear on them the second he realised that they weren't fighting the same way. You know, so he obviously figured out that, you know, they... That for whatever reason they had to change lions, or that, you know one or more of them was gone, or whatever. As soon as he figured that out, he should have just brought everything to bear and done his best to destroy them. You know, rather than getting cocky. Because that was ultimately his downfall. So, um, 
the fact that we still don't know what he's doing is annoying. As I said, this season suffers from being only seven episodes long because it feels incomplete, is my honest assessment. If, you know, the, the, the thing I read basically said we're getting season four in probably about two or three months. So I'm glad I don't have to wait that long to get more. But at the same time, I'd almost rather they waited and released season three and four because I don't know how many episodes season four is going to be. If it's another seven, then I would have basically said, wait another couple of months and release them as one big chunk, rather than, you know, two and two. But, so. Either way, so yeah, that's pretty much all I've got. I mean, I've managed to talk for half an hour on this. Um, so, any comments? Yeah, comment section is there. As I say, if you're going to talk season three, just have the decency to spoil a warning it for people. And yeah, I really like this show. If you haven't seen it, you probably shouldn't have watched it at this point in the video. But I do strongly recommend it. And yeah, that's that's pretty much all I've got. So thank you very much for watching. And uh, assuming I can keep this up, I will hopefully see you next week.